Hola amigos, today I'm back with a short tutorial answering a question that I've been posted about many times, and that is how to change material parameters based on the distance to the camera. This is a simple effect, but many of you have asked about this on the comments, so I decided that it was a topic worth a detailed explanation. In this video, I will cover a few different ways to achieve and use this concept, which you can see here. We will apply this to a simple surface material, using it to change its color, and then extend that to apply a dithering effect and cheaply remove objects too close to the camera. Finally, we will see also how to use this in a post-process effect material, in this case a simple distortion applied to objects in the far distance. And without further ado, let's get started. Here is my scene setup, it's very basic, it's just a bunch of cubes arranged in a way that allows us to see these effects a bit better. We can go to the content browser and create a new material, and I'm going to call this one maybe something like material and distance based. And now with all these cubes selected, we can drag it here and replace the material by this one. Let me move this window over here and let's start working on this one. So basically, what we want to do is to blend or interpolate two different values based on a third one, which would be the camera distance. So search either for linear interpolate or simply blur. Oop. There we go. Now, this node works by mixing these two inputs, A and B, based on the third one called alpha. And we can blend between two different values of any type, vector 1, 2, 3, and 4, but the only requisite is that the inputs A and B have to be the same type. Or in other words, it's like you cannot mix a color with a number. So let's get to vector parameters, maybe near color, duplicate it, and call the second one far color. Now maybe this is a bright red, almost pink, and this one is green. Now we can connect this to the inputs A and B, and the output to the base color. Now by default, we have a value of alpha of 0 0.5, so we get this yellow color. And if we change it to 0, we'll get the first input, and a value of 1 will give us the second input. Now, there's two ways to measure the camera distance, so let's see the first one, which would be radial base. To measure this distance, we'll need to know the position of the pixel that we are rendering, so search for world position, and we are also going to need to know the position of the camera. So we can search for camera position, and both of these are in world space we can subtract one from each other. So world position minus camera position, and then get the length of this vector. So this is the distance to the camera. So in theory, we could just saturate this, connect to our alpha input, and hit apply and save and call it a day. However, it doesn't seem to work. Everything is green, and it's using the far color. And that's because the near color, right now it's applied only to the pixels at zero units from the camera, and the transition takes one unit. And that's too small to even be rendered. So we are not even showing the pixels that are orange or yellow. Let's fix that. This second method is going to be using the pixel depth. Let's move this out of the way for now and search for pixel depth. Now we can repeat the same operations that we did here. So let's copy the subtract, divide, and saturate nodes and reconnect this whole chain to the pixel depth. We don't need the subtract or land operations, but we can reuse the scatter parameters. So connect the offset to the subtract node and the maximum distance to the, oh, to the divide. Perfect. Now, 
before we change this, let me apply this material to this larger cube that I have here. And so with radial distance, we can see that the area where the color are changing is based on a radial measurement. So we have this arc as the pixels get farther away from the camera. Now, when we change this by the pixel depth method, let's reconnect the alpha, hit apply and save. Now, instead of an arc, we have a line because now this distance is measured to the camera plane, which is perpendicular to the camera view direction. And it would depend on the project needs or the visual uh, effect that you really want to achieve to choose one method or the other but both are equally valid. Now we can give all of these nodes their own comment box and rename it to something like camera depth. And now we can take a look at another common use of this technique, which is fade out objects based on camera distance. For that, the first thing that we have to do is go to our material parameters and change the blend mode from opaque to mask. We could do this with translucent materials but if we stack a lot of objects in front of each other with different opacities, the rendering can become really expensive. And keeping it as mask will reduce the cost. Now this enables our opacity mask output in our material, and to generate this mask, we're going to use a node called Dither Temporal Anti-Alias. This node outputs a mask, or a pattern, that is similar to TV static composed of black and white pixels. Now, the amount of black and white pixels depends on this alpha threshold. A value of zero will return a black mask and a value of one returns a white mask. And values in between generate a random distribution with more or less pixels of each value. So this is a value, an input, that requires a number zero to one and conveniently are saturated it's just that, so we can connect this here to the alpha threshold and the result to the opacity mask. And now we can apply and save and take a look. Great, now these cubes fade out when the camera gets really close to them. You could imagine this being used as a master material in some kind of, for example, a dungeon crawler when, when the players get inside a cave the camera gets closed and all the exterior walls disappear, or similar things. But you might have noticed that we don't have shadows anymore. Let's see what happens if we use the other method. So I'll replace this saturate with the other saturate from the radial distance. Now apply and save. And now our cubes have shadows, but when they fade out, we get this ugly artifact on the intersection with the ground. Now, the reason why that is happening is, well, it depends, it's partially based on the way that Unreal renders mask and transparent or translucent objects. But you can think of it as when we use the camera depth, we are only seeing the front faces of the object because the back faces are occluded by the front. However, when we use the radial distance method, we're looking at every vertex on these objects independently of whether they are occluded or not by the camera. Now, as I mentioned before, the use of one method or the other could depend on your project needs. For example, you could hide these artifacts on the ground with objects that don't fade out to make the ground so noisy or with grass or rocks or something like that that you don't see these problems. To end the tutorial, let's take a look at how to use this technique in a post-process material. Let's start by setting up the scene by adding a post-process volume, creating a new material. We can call this one post-process material. distance based and let's take a look for a moment at the volume settings 
search for bound and check the infinite extent and then search all for for material add one element to this array and then choose asset reference and now we can drag our new material here perfect now we can start editing this one the first thing that we have to do is go to the material parameters and change the material domain from surface to post process now to fix the black scene we need to bring a scene texture and change the id to post process input 0 now if we connect, connect the color to the emissive color now we have our final render now i'm going to create a distortion effect by modifying these uvs but we've seen similar things in other tutorials so i won't go over it in crazy slow detail so first we need a texture sample with some noise maybe this game wind noise will work now we only need the red and green components so let's do a component mask and let's go add that to our texture coordinate now these values are really high they go all the way to one so before we add this let's multiply by maybe a scalar parameter in case we want to change it later call this one distortion scale oops set it to a really really tiny value maybe 0 0.05 and connect it here and i want to multiply this also to scale this texture a little bit so let's scale the uvs maybe 8 or 16 and also pan them so we get a little bit of motion maybe vertically 0 0.25 perfect now if we hit apply and save it's applied to the whole scene now to apply that based on the camera distance we can go back to our material and copy any of the two methods let's do the camera depth copy those nodes and also the two parameters Copy this, Control C, and then paste it here. Let's organize things. Make this one comment, and maybe this is the other comment. Call this this distortion. Now, instead of applying this with a value of one to the whole scene, let's multiply this. And before we add it, let's multiply by this saturate and it was applied to the whole scene now it should be applied based on this camera depth but if we hit apply and save it doesn't really work let's see how to fix this the problem is this pixel depth node this works with surface materials but not with post process ones so let's get rid of it and we can replace it either with a scene texture by changing the ID to the scene depth here or by adding a scene depth node. The difference is that this node defaults to the 0, 0 values instead of using the default coordinates. So we need to use this to give it an input. And now if we hit apply and save. It works. This part is not distorted, but uh, let's change the value so we can see it a little bit better. Let's say 5,000 here and 10,000. Yeah, this is a lot better. So now this effect is only applied to objects in the distance, but as the player gets close to them, the distortion effect disappears. And it can get really subtle. You could use this, for example, to represent heat distortion 
but in a way that doesn't affect objects really close to the player that would be more relevant for gameplay. To end the tutorial, let's see one of the many methods to animate these parameters. We can copy this entire box and remove this scene depth because we can reduce this sample. And then let's make some room on the comment box because we're going to multiply these two factors. So add two multiply nodes. And we're going to multiply them by a debug time sign. Here. This will output a sign value between 0 and 1. And normally you would use something like a scalar parameter and expose that to a gameplay function that controls this. But just for the example, this will be a lot faster. Let's scale this to maybe... 0.1, so it doesn't go really fast. And then reconnect the subtract and the divide. Now we're going to use this one, this new distance calculation, in a new lerp. So this lerp is going to be between the final color and a value of 0. I said that these inputs have to be the same type, and if it's a single value, like here, uh, it will assume that all the components in a vector 4 will be 0. So this, in reality, is run as 0, 0, 0, 0. Now for the alpha, let's connect our saturate, and then connect this to the emissive color. Let's give it a go. So, perfect. We have this darkness encroaching in, in the player and going away. And it doesn't matter the player where the player is facing, it always gets him. And right now this looks like something from a trippy, bad horror game. But using this technique, you can create effects like, for example, the transition between different vision modes in the Batman or the Assassin's Creed games, and effects like that. And that's all I have for this tutorial. Before we end the video, though, I have something to say. I know I haven't been putting out as much content as usual, but between projects, both personal and from work, and also I had to deal with both physical and mental health problems, I haven't been able to work on these videos as much as I liked, but despite all those difficulties, we managed to go past 5,000 subscribers, which I know that compared to other YouTube channels is nothing, but to me it means a lot. And I don't have words to explain how thankful I am for all the support that you guys give me through comments, likes, and subscribes. And with all that, the only thing remaining to say is thank you for watching. See you next time.